have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. As we continue where we left off last week. I imagine if you have been a Christian for any time at all, uh, there have been times where you have experienced what I would call uh, great spiritual failure in your life. Uh, there's been times where uh, the Christian life oftentimes operates this way, right? We are, uh, we're doing well, we're, things are going great. Sometimes we are in what we call a spiritual high, right? Where, man, we just, things have, <laughs> I remember many times as a teenager coming home from, from Bible camp, you know, you've got a week where you're just immersed in the Word of God, and you make commitments, uh, you make decisions, you say, Lord, this is what I'm going to do, and, and my life is yours, and then you get home, and you, you fail, right? You fall, you, you, you do exactly what you said you would not do. Uh, maybe that happens sometimes on Sundays, you gather, and you hear the Word, and you feel convicted, and you say, Lord, I hear you. And forgive me, and, and this week, I want to walk with you. This week is going to be different, and then this week's not any different. Uh, and, and that happens many times. Many times we, we experience failure like this, and, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the Word of God. I'm certainly thankful for the grace of God. Uh, but what we're looking at tonight as we come to Exodus chapter 33 is the people of God right on the heels of one of the greatest spiritual failures that we have seen in the life of God's people. Um, you know, after experiencing his supernatural deliverance, uh, you know, within months, I mean, as God, God has just, he has led them through the wilderness. He's provided for every need. Uh, they have experienced his salvation, his sustenance, his grace, his mercy, uh, his love has been on display. His power has been on display. And then they enter into this covenant with God saying, you know, I will be your God. You will be my people. And they say, yes, Lord, that's what we want. We want to follow you. We want to obey you. And then with, within days of entering into this covenant with God, they're at the base of the mountain worshiping a golden calf. And, and we, we see that and we just think, how does that happen? How can someone experience such grace and such glory and, and, and see God's deliverance and then turn their back on him. And yet, if we're honest, we've probably done that ourselves many times. And, and, and what we found as we looked at chapter 32 is, man, swift judgment came upon the camp, right? I mean, 3,000 people died that day and then God chastised the people as a whole. A plague came upon the entire nation. We don't know what all that entailed, but they got a very clear picture that this God is the true God, and we are not to worship any other God. And, and you might think at that point, and that was the big concern, right, that God was just done with them. But you know, Moses pleaded on their behalf. Remember, he went back up to the mountain trying to make atonement for them, which he could not do. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And, and so... You know, we see God's mercy on display in the fact that he tells Moses, you're still going to go into the land. I'm, I'm still going to keep my promise. And so in spite of their failure, we see a picture of God's mercy. And what we're going to see tonight in Exodus 33 is how do we respond? How do we, re how do we respond to spiritual failure in our life? But let's have a word of prayer and we'll dig into the word of God together. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you once again for the privilege we have of, of coming into your house uh, to gather into your presence. Uh, Lord, you have bid us come. You have told us to come boldly before your throne, not because of who we are, but because of Jesus. Uh, we have an advocate with you, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And Lord, although we have failed you and we have sinned against you in countless ways, uh, we come we come in the name of Jesus. We come through the blood of Jesus. And Father, I'm thankful that, um, that you have given us your word. And I pray now as we uh, open it, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see wondrous things. Lord, I am inadequate for this task. Uh, there's so much here. I pray that you would work in spite of me, that you would be glorified, that Jesus Christ would be lifted high tonight. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, and amen. 
And so in somewhat a surprising move, what we're going to see in, in verses 1 through 3, Moses is on the mountain, he's talking with the Lord, and God's instruction to Moses we see in verse, the first three verses here in chapter 33. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And, and it's really important that we kind of gather exactly what God is saying here to his people. He, he's just told them. Go, right? Leave Sinai. Go to the land that I have promised. The land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's yours. And I'm going to send an angel ahead of you. And I'm going to give you victory over all of your enemies. Right? And this land, it's a good land. Right? It's a land that is, it, your every need will be supplied. Right? You'll have everything you want. You'll have great success. You'll have great prosperity. And, and you hear that and you go, Sounds like a good plan, Lord. But, but, I'm not going to go with you. Right? My presence will not be with you. Now, to this point, the people of God have experienced God's presence in a, in a spectacular way. God has led them day in and day out, right? Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Moses certainly has experienced God's presence. But now he's saying, you can go and you can have all of my promises, but not my presence. And I need to ask you tonight, how's that sound? Yeah, I don't know, but I, I, I believe this. I think there are a lot of people who take that deal. I think there's a lot of people who say, well, I'd, I'd miss you, Lord, but this sounds pretty good, right? I get all of this. I get everything you promised, right? Prosperity, success, I'm not going to have any needs. I like it. In fact, I think that's the way many people respond to God today. Right? Many times, you know, they don't really want a relationship with God. They just want, they want, they want heaven, right? They want a good life. They want a prosperous life. And, and so the idea of getting all of the good gifts of God without God Sounds appealing to many people. It, it's really, I know, right? You guys are here on Wednesday night. And you're spiritually mature. And you're going, no. But I think a lot of people would respond by saying, you know what? If I can have all of that and not you, I'll take it. Right? You get the best deal, right? I get everything. Imagine just for a moment, imagine with me that, that God says to Grace Gospel Church, right? I'm, I'm going to fill your church to overflowing, right? I mean, I'm just going to fill it with people, and as a church, you're going to make a tremendous impact on your community, right? You're, I'm going to gift you with, with, great, with, with, with great leadership, and I'm going to gift you with all of the resources you need. There's not going to be any budget concerns, right? There's not going to be any concern about, we're going to make sure that everything you need, everything you want is supplied. And so your services will be filled with people, and your services will be exciting. But I'm not going to be there. Would that be Okay. Would we even notice the difference? I mean, we should, right? I mean, and, and sadly, sadly, I think, and maybe I'm wrong, I think that many churches operate under that mindset that if our doors are, I mean, if, if, if our seats are full and things are going well, then God must be here, right? That's kind of how we evaluate things, right? Well, God is with them because look, and everything is happening. But what do we see here? We see that God says, you get all of this, but I'm not there. Right? You, you have all of the blessings, all of the supplies, but you don't have God. And, and I, I think many times people associate blessing and, and, and good gifts with God's presence. Even on an individual level. 
right? If you take this down from the corporate level individually, just what if God were to promise you health, wealth, and prosperity? Right? I mean, there are people within our church family who would, man, they they give anything to be healthy, right? Not to feel pain, right? Not to hurt every single day, right? And, and so God says you can have perfect health and you can have success and you can be prosperous, but I will not be with you. How many people's taken that deal? I mean, there's a lot of people, right? Sign me up, right? I'll take that. If we understand what it means to be a Christian, then we must, we must say no to that, right? We can't say, I want all of this good, but not God, right? Because God's presence is the point, <laughs> right? If God is not present and we don't have him, then we have nothing. We have nothing. <laughs> Look, we said last week, this, this, this whole golden calf account parallels the, the fall in the garden really closely, right? So you have this, you know, Adam and Eve, they sin, they hide from God, God confronts their sin, they make excuses, right? Not my fault, and we saw that happening in the camp when Moses comes back and Aaron says, it was your fault, no, it was their fault. And what happens, right? Adam and Eve, right? God makes a covering for their sin, but he casts them out of the garden, Right? And, and they can't come back in. Why can they not come back in? They'll die, right? I mean, it's for their own protection and their own good that they are cast out of. To that point, prior to their sin, Adam and Eve enjoyed perfect fellowship. They enjoyed pr the presence of God. And now, to this people, he is saying, you are a stiff-necked hard-hearted people, and I cannot go with you or I'll kill you. I'll wipe you out. Right? And so it's a very similar thing that's happening here. Our sin alienates us from God. And that's what we see in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. It says that apart from Christ, we are separated, alienated strangers to God. But then listen to verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Right? So yes, separated by our sin, but then God sent Jesus into the world that we would be brought near. That that relationship could be restored and we could enjoy his presence once again. Right? See, presence is the point. All month long in December, we sing that song, Emmanuel. What does it mean? God with us, right? Jesus left the glories of heaven, came to earth, showing us what God is like, giving us a perfect picture, making it possible for us to have this relationship with God. And then, right, when he was getting ready to go to the cross and die, be raised again and ascend to the right hand of the Father, he says to his disciples, I will not leave you orphans, right? John 14, 16, I'll ask the Father. He will give you another helper to be with you forever. <laughs> Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. You catch that? That's presence on a different level. God has promised now, not only is he going to be with us, but he is going to be in us. So as followers of Christ, we experience God's presence in a way that his people have not to this point. We have the indwelling spirit of God individually, personally, but also corporately. We see that in 1 Corinthians 3, that God indwells his church. In fact, I would say this. I said presence is the point, right? Well, the absence of God's presence is, is hell, right? That's what hell is. Hell is the absence of God for all eternity. Eternal separation. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 gives us this picture in verses 7 through 9. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus... They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction 
away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. That's what it means to experience eternal damnation, is to experience separation from God. The lack of God's presence. And so this is what God has wanted, right? From the beginning, God has wanted to experience intimate, personal relationship with his people. But now, in this moment, as a result of their failure, as a result of their sin, he is saying, I will not go up with you. Now, we have seen over and over again Israel's failure, right? I mean, we have washed at times thinking, you have got to be kidding me, right? I mean, how could they do that? How could they, how could they respond like that? But notice how they respond here, right? In verses 4 through 6, we see this. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Oreb onward. Right, so the Israelites get the message. Right? Moses says, God says go. You get the promises, but you don't get him. And for the people of Israel, the idea of prosperity without the Lord's presence, is disastrous. They, they say, right? They say, we want nothing to do with a future apart from him. <laughs> if, Lord, if you do not go with us, we don't want to go. And, and I think that's the point here. God is placing before them a test. You can have all of this, but not me. And then they're faced with a choice. Do I take all of these good gifts? Or do I wait here until God says, I'll go with you? And, and how they respond is of great importance to us, particularly those of us who have experienced spiritual failure. Right? They're given this choice, and, and they say, right, the Lord says, take off your ornaments. And they say, okay, Lord, ornaments are going. Now you say, what, what is that? Well, those are, in, in a sense, it's a picture of mourning. Right? They it's almost like funeral, right? You don't get, you don't put all your bling bling on when you're going to a funeral, right? But and in another sense, these are items that they use for worship in Egypt, right? So these ornaments were, and so they're putting away. How long do they put them away? From the time they moved on. This is true, genuine repentance by the people of Israel. Lord, we were wrong. We broke your commandments. We broke your covenant. We're turning away from these idols, and we're turning back to you. They put their ornaments away, and they begin to look to the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that they immediately take off and God goes with them, right? They have consequences for their sin. At this point, they're just kind of at a standstill. And we're going to get a picture of what life is like for them far from God's presence. In verses 7 through 11, notice... Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, the Lord's, the Lord's intention, remember, was always to dwell among his people. Right? He had just given them the, all of the plans for the tabernacle. This tent is not the tabernacle, right? It hasn't been constructed yet. But he's given them instructions. And the tabernacle was meant to, to be placed right in the heart of the camp, right? Right in the middle. And, and so God intended to dwell in the midst of his people. But now, as a result of God's word, Moses takes his tent and sets it far outside the camp. And so now, when Moses meets with the Lord... 
the people are back in the camp, and they see this vis- visual image, right? The, the pillar of cloud that, that led them day after day, now coming to the very tent door of Moses. And Moses meets with God. The Scripture says face-to-face. And we know it's not an actual face-to-face meeting. The idea here is it's an intimate, close relationship, fellowship that Moses is experiencing with the Lord. We know it's not actual face-to-face because Moses is going to tell him here at the end of the chapter that if you see me, you're going to die, right? So not that, but it's just this picture of close intimacy where he says, right, as a friend, talks with a friend, Moses was able to speak with the Lord. And there's Joshua standing guard. at the. Nobody comes here but Moses. Everybody else is outside. And they do. They see this unfolding, and they worship, but they worship from afar. And this is not what was meant to be, right? It was intended that they would worship God. They would be at the heart and center and enjoy the same fellowship and the same intimacy that Moses is experiencing here. Really, an incredible picture. When when we think about, can you imagine? What what we've talked, Adam and Eve walking and talking in the garden. Moses meeting God face to face at his tent. But this is the kind of intimacy, the kind of fellowship that God wants to have with his people, and that God wants to have with you. Close fellowship. The Lord Jesus said in John 15 and 15, No longer do I call you servants, for servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. The way in which Jesus says, I want to relate to you, not as a servant, but as, as friends. Right? This close fellowship and yet because of their sin right they have they're, they're they're not able to experience this kind of relationship that god wanted and intended from the beginning now at this point as we move forward moses is going to do what he has done many times already he's going to intercede for the people so during this intimate meeting as he's talking with the lord verse 12 moses said to the lord See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Moses very boldly here says, Lord, you say you know me, and you say that I found favor in your sight. If that's true, you've got to tell me what's going on. Right? You want me to go. You want me to lead this people, but you haven't let me in on the plan. I don't know this angel you're talking about from this. I've always followed you, Lord. I've always, ever, from, the, from the bush till now, I've followed you. What's this plan? And then he says in verse 13, consider too that this nation is your people. Lord, these are your people that you saved, that you rescued. Your name is on the line here. And so Moses very boldly comes before the Lord, and he says, Lord, we've got to do better than this. We can't just go without you. And so in verse 14, the Lord responds, and he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Sounds good. And then Moses says, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Now, you hear that, and you go, Moses, didn't you hear what he said? <laughs> I'm going to go with you, right? I, I, I'll, I'll give you rest. But Moses heard exactly. In fact, there's a couple things we want to pull out here. Right. Number one, when, when the Lord responds to Moses, he says, I will go with you, and I will give you rest. It's all in the singular. So he's saying, Moses, I'll be with you. And then Moses responds, if your presence will not go, and that with me is kind of in parentheses there it's not in the original right it's just kind of added if your presence will not go do not bring us up from here plural so moses is saying god we've got to think about more than me here right there's a people a community of faith at stake i'm part of something bigger than me and if you're just going to be with me that's not enough you need to go with us as we leave this place. Now, again, as we kind of stop and we think, in our 
self-centered, me-first culture, this sounds like a pretty good deal. The Lord says, I'll be with you. I'll bless you. I'll give you rest. And you say, I'll take it, (laughs) right? And Moses says, wait a minute, Lord. It's not just about me. And it's good for us to stop and remember that we are part of something bigger, right? We always want to think of our Christian life as more than just this personal walk. We're part of a corporate people, right? Certainly part of the church universal, but then the church local is how we're involved in that. And so as we operate in that, we want to think, Lord, your blessing is for all of your people. And and they need to experience your presence. And so Moses, secondly, is making it very clear, if you aren't with us, then we don't want to go. In fact, if you're not with us, you might as well just kill us right here, right? He's desperate for God's presence. And and I, I would say this should be the desire of every single follower of Christ. Lord, if you're not in this, It's, it's worth nothing, right? If, if, if you're not with me, if you're not with us, it's meaningless, pointless. We want nothing. And I can say this wholeheartedly. We want, as a, as a leadership here, we want nothing to do with a church apart from the presence of God. I would rather have five people in God's presence than 5,000 people without We are desperate for God's presence. We want nothing individually. We want nothing to do with life apart from him. Jesus said very plainly, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing of any spiritual value. Nothing of anything that brings glory to God. We can do all kinds of things and accomplish many things, but not things that matter for eternity without him. I don't don't want to operate as a husband and a father and as a, you know, without his presence. I desperately need that. And that's what Moses is saying here. Lord, I'm not taking a step unless you go with me. And notice his reasoning there in verse 16. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth? What's he saying here? Lord, The way that you get glory is when they recognize that you're with us. We're distinct. We're your people. What is it that sets the people of Israel apart? Well, it's certainly not, right, not who they are. They were were the, the lowest, right? They were nobodies. They had nothing. They had no possessions. They had no land. This is not, this is not a people that anybody would have looked at and said, wow, look at them. And yet, nations around looked at them and said what? God is with them. And so in that sense, Moses appeals to the Lord and says, you must go with us. This is, this is how we're known, and this is how you get glory. You get glory by your working in us, working through us. And that's true. Listen, verse 17, I love the Lord's response. The Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Wow. I mean, we, we hear that, we, we, wow, what a special privilege that Moses has. God says, you are a recipient of my grace. You have my favor, and I know you. I, I, I know you. I can I can pick you out of a crowd, Moses. Right? He's experienced this relationship. And can I say, brothers and sisters, we have experienced his grace. And the Lord says that he knows us in this intimate, experiential way. We, in Christ, experience the presence of God. We have this promise. Jesus has said what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. He has promised his spirit in dwelling us as his people. We have this incredible privilege. As 
as people in Christ who were once separated, once alienated, now brought near, like Moses, we can go before the very throne of God. And God says, I hear you. I hear you. I know you. And here he says, I will grant your request. I will go with you. I will be with you. And everyone will know that's God's people. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be glorious? If people look at your life and just say, man, you can see God's hand in their life. It's evident. It's evident in the way that, it's evident in their marriage. It's evident in their home, right? It's evident in the way that they raise their children. Look at that church. Look at, look at how God's hand is upon them. There's, there's no way that those things are accomplished apart from God's presence. And again, this is not measured by, right, worldly estimation of success. Many times it's measured by, that's impossible unless God shows up, right? That's how we see it. God shows up and says, I've done something that is impossible in man's ability. And this is what happens here. He says, I will be with you. I will hear your, I, I will answer your prayer. And at that point, you know, Moses gets the answer that he's looking for. You think he's just going to say, thanks, Lord. All right, we're done. But he doesn't. He, he presses even further. Right? And so in verse 18, Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I think, Moses, you've seen more of God's glory than anyone else. I mean, you, you got to see the, the, the burning bush, and you were on the mountain with, him, with God, and, and now he's coming into your tent, and you're getting faith. What more do you want? And what we see with Moses is, is something that we see typical throughout the Scripture, and that is the more that you see and the more that you know God, the more you want. This is the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 saying, I know you, and I want to know you more. I want to experience the fellowship of your sufferings, right? Paul's saying, I want to know you in a deeper way. And that is what we should expect as God's people, right? The more that we experience, the more that we know him, the more that we want to know him. We should never be satisfied in our walk with Christ. Always seeking, wanting to know him more. And this is what Moses says. I want to see more of your glory. Now, the next time we're together, we're going to talk about what he says here. Because the way in which God reveals himself is not primarily through this visible manifestation, right? It's through his word, right? He declares himself. And, and we'll see that again in chapter 34. We'll talk more about that. So when it says, I'm going to pass by and you're going to see my back, but you're not going to see, it's not, this is anthro, <laughs> anthropomorphism, all right? This is not, you know, God's not actually, you're not going to see this big figure walking in his backside and all that. That's not the picture. The picture is simply that, Moses, what you're asking for is more than you can handle. Right? It's more than you can possibly take. You know, just imagine, you know, you, you can see the effects of the sun. You can feel it, right? You can see the rays. But if you look directly into it and you stare directly into it, it's going to blind you, right? You can't do it. Well, that's what, that's what God is saying here to Moses. Moses, what you're asking for, you can't handle. It's too much. Right? But I'll give you a little more. And that's, a, that's the way, right? We're growing from one degree of grace, one degree of glory to another, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So we... We see him, we get more and more, and we want more and more. This is what we should expect. Psalm, Psalm 1611 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. And as I've read this, I thought, man, this is what we need. 
This is what we need as a church more than anything else. We need a, an intense desire for God's presence and God's glory. I, I pray with all of my heart that God makes us the church that thirsts and longs for his presence, that wants to see him, that wants to know him. What we see, what we see so often in the scripture, you think of Isaiah, right? Isaiah chapter 6, and the glory of the Lord fills the temple. Right? This, isn't that what we should want every Sunday as we gather together? That God's glory would be evident in this place. In, in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, the, the church gathers together to pray, and, and it says that, that God shakes the place, and they are all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they leave speaking the word of God with boldness. God does an incredible work as the people of God gather together, and he fills them with his presence. That is what we need. That is what we need. I know it's Wednesday night, but do you, do you have the presence of God in your life? It begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, right, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Right, so through Jesus Christ, we see the clearest picture of God. And he's the one who brings us back into a right relationship with him. And so, you know, this is what Jesus did for you. He died for you. He became a substitute for your sin. He took the wrath that you deserved on himself. And when you receive the gift that he offers, you, you, you're, you experience this restoration, this fellowship with God. And, and you experience this renewed presence with God. And so if, if you do not know him, that's your greatest need tonight. I, in closing, I, I think of Psalm 51. And this is David's kind of prayer of repentance. But in verse 11, he says, Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Right? In this moment, as David pleads with God, right, he's, he's asking God, Lord, I don't want to experience an absence of your spirit. And my question, my question that I asked earlier for us as a church, and my question for you individually is this. If the Holy Spirit were to pull out of your life for a week, would you notice? Would you miss him? Right? Or would life just go on pretty much as usual? It's a shame to think, but we could do church. We could show up and we could do it. And not have God's presence. And people could walk out the doors and say, man, that was a great service. Right? Everything was done perfectly. And the message was what I wanted. And the music was what I wanted. And God was not there. God forbid. God forbid that ever be true. May we plead. May we seek. May we be desperate for the presence of God. Let's close tonight in prayer.